minister to the United Ministries, which is an interdenominational group of denominations that supported uh, putting a campus pastor here at Ball State to work with students from those denominations. He had a passion for uh, uh, touching base with the different religious communities, and the Jewish community was certainly one of those. He started this Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Days of Remembrance, in 1985. This is the 15th annual that we've had and is a very highly valued tradition here, and we're delighted to have all of you here. We are unable to put uh, down more chairs simply because we are at the uh, capacity that is allowed for this room, so if there is anyone else that wants to come in, they may, uh, but they'll have to stand or sit on the floor. Feel free to come up front and sit on the floor. That might throw the... I shouldn't have suggested that, should I? <laughs> Me and my brainstorms. Oh, well. Um, my name is Richard Fears. I teach religious studies uh, in the philosophy department at Ball State University. Some of you have seen my ugly mug on Channel 5 this semester, uh, teaching religious of America. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. And uh, I don't recommend it unless you're looking for a, uh, a good chance to go to sleep on Channel 5 between 9.30 and 10.45 on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. That was a paid commercial. Uh, whatever. All right. I would like to call attention to my committee members, and as I look at my notes, I forgot, no, I've got the names here. I thought I'd forgotten to list the names. I'd like, this is the product of a lot of work over the last several months by a number of people uh, that have had a commitment to this tradition, and I'd like for them to stand when I read their name, and if you want to applause, please hold it till the end. Uh, Marty Craig from the Indiana Academy, Ken Davis from the Art Department, Charlie Gilbert from Baptist House, Dave Kamens from uh, Academic Advising, Judy Kaur, Dean of Library and Public Service, Roseanne Merrick, Chairman of History Department, and Charles Payne from the Secondary and Higher, Ed, Higher and Foundation uh, Education. Let's give them a hand for their work. <laughs> I'd also like to uh, make the quick list of those who have given us uh, funding and have given us support. Certainly we give great thanks to the Provost's Office, to Benjamin and Bessie Ziegler Fund, to the Office of Leadership and Service Programs here at the Student Center, Temple Bethel, the local synagogue, Departments of History, Philosophy, Secondary Higher and Foundations of Education, Academic Advising, Baptist House, and Wesley Foundation. A great big thank you to Bracken Libraries uh, Ed Resources, Circulation, Technical Services, Booking Desk, Equipment, Special Collections, Assistant Dean for the Library, Public uh, Services, and Dean's Office. Everyone has been so cooperative to help us do this event. We're delighted that we are able to have such a, a good response. At this point, let me introduce to you the Dean of the College of Science and Humanities, Dr. John Stone. It is certainly with a great deal of poignant irony that this special day of remembrance of some of the darkest days and events in human history, the Holocaust or genocide of European Jewry, should come in the midst of yet another example of religio-ethnic genocide that is underway again in Europe, in Kosovo, this moment as we speak. Not that we don't see evidence of such satanic behavior every day somewhere, often in many places on this globe of ours. We think of Rwanda, of Nigeria, of Cambodia, of Ethiopia, all of such recent memory. While this continual surfacing of genocidal acts now here, now there. This may tend to lull our many into complacency. It tends to dull our sense of outrage and it weakens our resolve. And in that situation, we have to hope that by remembering and reminding ourselves repeatedly both of our sins of commission, but particularly our sins of omission, in not 
objecting soon enough, loudly enough, and forcefully enough in the past. And because of that, we hope that we will not be guilty ourselves of such acts in the future, and we might restrain others as well. Unfortunately, others do, uh, do not remember. They do not want to remember, or they do remember, but take pride in their emulating of past behaviors. I suspect Slobodan Milosevic would, in moments of candor, take immense pride should someone compare him to fascist butchers of the past. As I suggested a moment ago, it is easy to find contemporary instances of genocidal behavior all over the globe. And it is easy for us to say, oh, what terrible acts, what despicable people, what savages over there or back then. But ignore some facts that should stare us in the face at a time like this. And I'll mention only two. One, the veneer of civilization is very thin everywhere and in everyone. And it is easily punctured and stripped away. Second, the ethic of civility and tolerance and protection of all people's rights to freedom of choice is so quickly and easily shattered. And the rationalizations that come from genocidal viruses come so quickly and so dominantly that any of us as human beings can so quickly be led down the path. And so we must remember and we must remind ourselves of what we have tolerated and what our brothers and sisters, so much like us, from the heritage that we have, what they have done in the past. If we continue to remember and remind one another to remember, maybe we won't be genocidal perpetrators or tolerators. That's certainly an important beginning to begin with us. And so tonight, we do remember, as we are led back in time, but a very recent time, by a woman who witnessed firsthand and endured the atrocities of the Holocaust itself. Our guest tonight, Gisela Weiss, of Jewish heritage from Budapest, Hungary, who survived the labor camps and became aware gradually of the murder of 600,000 fellow Hungarian Jews. Hungarians who joined the millions of other Jews throughout Europe who were murdered solely because of their birth, that their birth heritage was Jewish. But Gisela Weiss escaped and survived and comes to us from her home in Indianapolis to tell her story and to help us remember. We, we welcome you, Mrs. Weiss. Kívánok. Legyenek üdvözölve, és köszönöm, hogy eljöttek engem meghallgatni. These few words were Hungarian. I said I am glad you are here, and thank you for you to come to listen to me. My name is Gisela Weiss, and I will tell you my story. Something happened in Europe in the middle of this century. A tragedy of such major proportions that we call it the Holocaust. Brutally, senselessly, innocent people were tortured and slaughtered. Six millions of them were Jewish. I was supposed to be one of them. The plan was to eliminate 
everybody, young, old, sick, healthy, who had the Jewish faith. I am Jewish, but I escaped just by the hair of faith, just by accident, just by, just by miracle. I wonder, should we care? Why should you care what happened with a girl 50 years ago, 50 some years ago in Europe? I try to make it understandable for you. Imagine a country, Hungary, the same size as Indiana. Imagine the people very much like yourself. The seasons the same as we have here, spring, summer, fall, and winter, educated, non-educated, working, non-working, healthy, sick, very similar people <laughs> like you, yourself. I was born in the capital of Hungary. At that time, the capital had one million population. In the total country of Hungary, there were about 10 million people. Of the 10 million, approximately 600,000 were of the Jewish faith, a minority. We, my family, mother, father, brother, lived a very un unexciting, everyday life like you probably lived as when you were children. We had a dog, we had a cat, we took vacations, both my parents were working, and we hoped for the future. It was no difference between me and the other child in the neighborhood who wasn't Jewish. It went all during my childhood, up until the war started. When the war started in 1939, I was 11 years old. We heard rumors from the other countries, neighboring countries, what is happening with Jewish people, but we were not certain. It was not in the newspaper. We just heard it as rumors. But the radio and the newspapers didn't bring the real news. By the time the Nazis came into Hungary to occupy Hungary, 1944, March 19th, millions of people from the neighboring countries were gassed and burned. And, and I emphasize, we did not know it. The population, the Hungarians, or the Jewish religious, religion Hungarians did not know what went on already with the people who were taken away. On March 19, when the Germans came in, they came with cars and horses in elegant uniforms with loud music coming in the main thoroughfares of the city. They came and occupied every position that was leading the country. They occupied the parliament, they occupied the radio, the newspaper in one day. And as soon as they came in, they started restrictions toward the Jewish people. They started ordinances, one after the other. In Budapest, we were somewhat fortunate. There were over 100,000 Jews living in the capital and the rest in the country. In the country, they collected the people and they put them in ghettos. And from the ghettos, they took them to concentration camps. When you hear in America, you hear the word ghetto, you think of a neighborhood with a few blocks of poor people, maybe densely populated, no work, no help, broken families, sickness, and poverty, mainly. That is not a ghetto. A ghetto is a group of buildings surrounded by a fence, sometimes tall wooden fence, sometimes bricks, and closely enclosed the number of bricks, the number of buildings with one gate in and out. And the gate is watched by people in uniform and weapon. They check everybody who goes in and check everybody who goes out. In the ghetto of Budapest, in every room, there were 14 souls living. 
When I say every room, I don't mean only the bedrooms, the living room, the pantry, the corridor, the kitchen, the bathroom. On the average, 14 people were gathered and squeezed into that small territory, the Budapest ghetto. That was in Budapest, but in the province, in the rest of the country, the people were gathered within days, practically, in two months, all the Jews from the countryside of Hungary were gathered and put in ghettos in their own neighborhood. And they lived sometimes under the sky without, without any shelter, no food, no water. And from these ghettos, they were taken to the concentration camps. We lived in Budapest. They did not take us with the cattle cars. I tell you what happened later. Here, this is an excerpt from the Encyclopedia Judaica, and I read this. The ghettoization was started in the provinces with daily transports of two, three thousand. Some ghettos <coughs> were set up sporadically in different parts of the country arbitrarily initiated by local authorities. The ghettoization in the rest of the country, except for the capital, Budapest, was completed simultaneously. The Jews were driven out of their homes in the night, allowed to pack only a minimal supply of food and some strictly necessary personal belongings, and then assembled at temporary collection points. The, provis the provisional ghettos were set up in school buildings, synagogues, or factories outside the towns. In the large Jewish population centers, ghettos were established in the vicinity of the towns, mainly in brickyards, barracks, or out in the open. The rounding up of the entire Jewish population of the country has taken practically two months. Ghettoization was immediately followed by an inventory of movable property and the sealing of those houses that had belonged to Jews. The Jews were permitted to add a few items of food and clothing to their scanty baggage during the inventory, which in most cases was accompanied by gender brutality and looting by the civilian auxiliary personnel. That happened in the province. People were shooed out of their own home in the middle of the night sometimes and gathered in a collecting place and waited, waited. And the biggest, biggest weapon of the Germans or the Nazis was the secrecy. Nobody knew where these people will be taken. Already thousands, perhaps millions, were gassed and burned. And the Hungarian Jews did not know, did not know what happens at the end of the road. They knew, that was they told, that all the labor is necessary for the betterment of the Hungarian country in order to win the war. And they obeyed. And they went where they were ordered. And many times when I go and keep speeches, children put up their hands and ask me, why did you go? Why didn't you say no? I answer this way. You could not say no to these forces for the simple reason that they had weapons and we didn't. Even today, the population of Hungary is not allowed at all to carry weapons. And the gendarmerie, the soldiers, the policemen do. So it was no reason to resist these actions because you couldn't resist. They had the gun and you didn't, as simple as that. Those people were gathered in the ghetto, put into <coughs> cattle cars, and taken to various concentration camps. And while this was going on, we still did not know where these wagons are going in Budapest. Budapest is a city of culture. It is a beautiful place. We had numbers of universities, theaters, opera house, uh, zoo, uh, all kind, botanical gardens, beautiful place. And here, the Germans were toward the end of the war, 
and they were on the losing side. They did have wagons for the population of the country, but they ran out of wagons by the time the Jews of Hungary would have to be taken to the camps. Therefore, they resolved a different scheme, a different, different method to get rid of us. They collected the people who were able to be working and put them in labor camp. I say labor camp, not concentration camp. And you might want to know what is the difference between a labor camp and a concentration camp. A labor camp is a forced labor camp, forced labor unit where men or women are working heavy, heavy labors without food, without appropriate shelters, without rest, practically till death. That is a labor camp. Many, many, many Hungarian Jews perished in those labor camps. The concentration camp, on the other hand, is destined for your death. What they did in the concentration camp was also work the people very heavily, but as soon as a person ran out of energy, could not produce heavy physical labor, they selected the person. Every day there were selections, selections in the concentration camps and took them to the gas chamber to gas them and after to burn their bodies in the crematorium. Many of my relatives, many of my husband's relatives finished their life in these camps, in these ovens. Most of the people, when they arrived to these camps, immediately went to the gas chambers. They appeared in the beginning at the front of the body of soldiers, some high-ranking officers, and they were selected. Women right, men to the left, and after they were separated by the sexes, they went at the front of a table, and the doctors, supposedly doctors, pointed at them, again, from the women's group, you go right, you go left, you go right, you go left. And mothers with young children were all pointed to go to the left. Old women, again, had to go to the left. The people who went to the right were able to work for a while, and those who went to the left were immediately taken to the gas chambers. They were herded by uniformed soldiers and dogs, big, big, vicious dogs. Nobody knew what is happening. If one of the existing inmates in the striped uniform tried to tell the newly arriving people what is happening, he was shot on the spot. So people went blindly. They didn't know what is happening. Most of the Hungarian Jews arrived to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the one, the one camp where most Hungarian Jews perished. There were numbers, numbers of camps like these, and people were executed by the thousand. What happened with these people when they got separated, destined for the gas chamber? They went through a large, large barrack where they had to leave their clothes, and at the end of the barrack, they were relieved from their hair because the Germans even used the hair of their bodies for some war purposes, and then ushered into a huge mess shower. Thousand people fit into the shower room. Sometimes they received towels and soaps to mislead the people that they will receive a shower. When they were in, <coughs> naked, and bereaved of all bodily hair, the doors were closed, and on the top of the ceiling, some shower heads opened up, and instead of water, gas came out. And it was a certain type of a gas that accumulated from the floor up. The longer you stayed in the room, the higher the gas became. Oxygen was left on the top of the room. What happened? People with stronger bones, stronger bodies, 
climbed on the other one. The babies and the little ones were crushed on their knees, and the strong ones wound up on the top of these huddled, inconvoluted, dead bodies. But everybody died. When they opened the gas chamber on the other side, people in striped uniform with leather-like carrying implements waited and cleared up the bodies very, very fast and showered down the room, which was full with blood and excrement. And as they took the people away from the gas chambers, and other commando and other group of people were there, opened the dead people's mouths and extracted the gold from them. The Germans even wanted the gold from the dead people's teeth. That happened with people in concentration camp. That happened with the people of the province of Hungary. I, as I said, I was in Budapest, living fairly well, even though the Germans were around, and it was threatening, but we didn't know what was the threat. Until one day, signs appeared on the side of the houses in the main streets of Budapest. Radio was already confiscated. Newspapers we were not allowed to have. The only thing that we relied on was rumor. We did not know. It is horrifying how people can be kept in the dark if you don't have the right information. So these posters appeared, and they announced that everybody, women and men, had to go to a certain place to help the Hungarian government to help them win the war. Fine, I was 16 years old. This picture is approximately of that time. Oh, by the way, before this all happened, we all had to put on this thing. We were discriminated in the house, in, on the street, in the city, everywhere. Jews had to wear this yellow star on their outer clothing. Everybody, children, old people, young people, we all had to put this on, and not only put it on, but sew it on very tightly on our clothing, because this is how they discriminated against us. The population who like to be sadistic, who like to play ugly jokes, they ordered the people with a yellow star down from the sidewalks. We had to walk in the mud among the cars. In the movies, they did not allow us to eat. To the swimming pool, we couldn't go. To public parks, we couldn't go. People, Jewish people, knowledgeable, professors, doctors, opera singers, were removed from their jobs. It was no possibility to exist, practically nil. It was a very, very difficult situation. We did not know what happened with the people in the villages and in the small towns, and we did not know what is going to happen with us. So I was taken into a labor camp, age 16, with a yellow star, and I was ordered to do forced labor. I described earlier what a labor camp was. It was to make the people die from the heavy work. I had to dig ditches with women, all ages, rather up till 40, 42, from 16 to 42, yes. And I had to dig three meter deep, three meter wide, long trenches. It was supposed to be tank traps in order to trap the tanks as they were coming against the Hungarians and the Germans. And these traps supposed to stop the tanks in their trap. But later on, I heard, and many of us heard, that people were buried in these trenches, in these ditches. It was a difficult existence, but still we were alive, and we knew what, we do heavy work, we get little to eat, but we exist. We, we do, we do, we, we, we get by. The work was difficult, and we got food only 
twice a day, in the morning, a piece of bread about that big, and a cup of coffee, or it was said it is coffee, it was very tasteless, dark liquid, nothing at noon, and at night, a bowl of soup and a piece of bread. And then we slept in a shelter. My shelter was furnished, furnished with straw. At home, I want you to know, I had piano lessons, I had German lessons, I went to school, I, I uh, went to dancing school, I went out with the boys, I went to birthday parties, I went to the beauty shop. I did the life like you are living here. And all of a sudden, I found myself sleeping on straw with 40 other women whom I didn't know in the same room and working with these women to the order of the Germans and didn't know to what end. That was my life in the labor camp. A bitter life, but it was an existence for a while. Until the war progressed and the Soviet tanks were indeed coming closer. And our captors did not want the women to be captured by the enemy. They rounded us up one night and ordered us to march on foot toward Germany on the highway. Can you imagine these women who were already half starved and worked beyond their capacity, beyond their strengths, get up in the middle of the night, put on their backpacks and go. Go where? Nobody knew. But we were herded because they had the gun and we didn't. Every one of us had a blanket. The blanket was a lifesaver. It was end of November, beginning of December. The climate is very similar to what we have here. And we had to sleep outside next to highways. How do you sleep in an open field when you have no shelter, no money, no freedom, no possibility to help yourself? Can you think, can you figure it out? How do people sleep under these circumstances, snow and rain, hardly a tree to get shelter? I tell you, we each had a blanket brought from home and we each had a friend because we had to have a friend. Someone you teamed up in the labor camp because alone you couldn't exist. She stood in line for the soup while I stood in line for the toilet. Or she stood in line to wash ourselves until I stood in line again to get a piece of bread or something else. So we helped out each other. And while one was away, the other watched their belongings on the straw floor because thievery was paid. Even among those people with doctorates, the people were stealing because they wanted to sustain themselves. So we each had a blanket, as I said. The two of us went around and looked for another couple of girls with two other blankets. The two of us found the other couple girls, we put down the two blankets on the top of the snow, we put the four girls on the top of it. We weren't too big, so we, four of us fit on the top of two blankets, and the other pair of blankets came over the top. So this is how we slept for a few nights, out in the open in December, on the side of the Hungarian highways. In the morning, we were waken up and heard that further, and the end of the road was concentration camps. But we didn't know it because they didn't say. The saying was that you go to help with your labor the Hungarian government. When the war is over, everything will be back to normal. In the meantime, I didn't know where my mother was, where my father was, and where my 12-year-old brother was. I don't know. I was among strangers, and that girl with whom I shared my time and my fortune in the labor camp, I just got to know her there. Everybody was a stranger. So we were herded like that on that march, 
And again, I will quote from the Encyclopedia Judaica. A group of about 85,000 Jews were directed on foot toward the Austrian border. A high percentage of persons on the death march perished on the way. At this period of time, until the liberation by the Soviet forces, about 98,000 of capital's Jews lost their lives in further marches, marches and train transports, as well as through Aerocross extermination squads. Aerocross was the collaborator of the Germans, a, thug, a group of young thugs in uniforms and guns. They had free robbery and free murder. They did what they wanted, like a bad, bad gang they were in uniform. Through Aerocross extermination squads, starvation, disease, and cases of suicide. Some of the victims were shot and thrown into the Danube. The Danube is a big river in Hungary. So, but why should we care? What difference does it make to you or to me how people acted and did at these times? We don't know. We don't know what difference does it make in our life, or do we? The world was silent. Jews begged friendly countries to entrance and to mercy, to let them in. The news came out of Germany, Poland, Hungary, but they kept quiet. Nobody made a big deal about it. The world was quiet. There was a ship coming out of Europe with 900 living souls on it, Jews, the ship St. Louis. It was headed for Cuba. Cuba was supposed to give them shelter out of Germany. And they arrived to Cuba, and Cuba did not open the door. <coughs> they were not let in. They sailed north toward Florida. They begged again the United States, let them in, let some of them in. No, nobody let them in. The ship finally had to go back to Europe, and they disembarked in one of the harbors, and most of them, of the 900, perished in the concentration camps. There are some <coughs> left, and I think about 200 sur survived out of the 900. Everybody else died. The world was silent. They did not want to know about the Jews. They did not want to know about the genocide that went on for years. Things are different today. We know what is happening in Kosovo. What happens is you all, I assume, have television. And you cannot help but look at the misery of the people, the same misery as we Jews went through in the middle of this century. There are differences, however. The people of Kosovo received shelters at places, not all of them, not always, but many of them, hundreds of thousands of them are in safe havens already. Not comfortable, without their home, without money, without belonging, most of the time without their health, but they are alive, some of them. There was no mercy for the Jews. At the end of the railroad travel, there was the gas, gas chamber destined for everybody, every Jew, regardless of age or condition. That was the difference. And that other big difference is that you and I are seeing it. We know what is happening, and as you can see on the news, there are 19 nations already gathered to help the poor victims somehow. Instead of closing their eyes and closing their door, we reach out and give them a hand. And I think that is beautiful. 
And I think that's why we should care. You never know what corner of the world, what force will get up and against what group of people. You may be one of them, just because you are blonde or just because you wear glasses or some other stupid things. It could happen to you. Or, on the other hand, you could be the perpetrator, as Dean Jansen said. God forbid that you should be one. I imagine those people must suffer through the rest of their lives for what they did. Their conscience must be bothering them a lot. And there is another element. I would like to direct your attention to it, and you are at the right place to know that. You have heard of mass communication. You know what internet can do. You know what a beeper can do. You know about the telephone, the radio, television, email, etc. You know these things exist. Now I warn you, it can work two ways. It can be for the better of humanity, betterment of humanity, or it can destroy also. Because news travel so fast and all kind of people can speak and write and send messages in these communication devices. And it can be good or evil. And I do hope that you, as you grow up, or you already are an adult, will work for it. That these mass communication tools should work for all of our benefits. Now I came here to talk to you and why I do that. It's not easy to go through in my mind of these things, but I came to talk to you because pretty soon I will be gone. I was the youngest of the generation of the Holocaust, and the older ones are already gone. I will be gone soon. But I hope that a little minuscule idea got into your brain, and you will try to remember that this inhumanity from one to the other is intolerable, and it doesn't lead to any good. I hope in your lifetime you will work for the better end of humanity. This is one reason I do this. And the other reason is that all those people whom I knew and whom I didn't know are waiting for me up there. And when I get there, I think they will ask me, what did you do? You stayed alive. Did you do anything? And I will be proudly saying, yes, I told about you to the rest of the people. And I think I did my duty. I thank you very, very much for listening to me. And I hope that I put some ideas in your head that will bring to you to other questions and see to it that these horrors that one human can do to the other will not happen in the future. We as Americans, live in freedom and democracy. We have a voice. Let's exercise it for the good of all of us. Thank you.
I was back many times to Hungary because my parents used to live there and things changed there very quickly. It was a country under communism for 40 years and now free enterprise is coming into the scene and much, much and heavy changes are taking place. Yes? How did you choose to live in Indianapolis? The question is, how did I choose to live in Indianapolis? There is a little story to that, and I will be very happy to tell you in a nutshell. <laughs> in the 1920s, in Transylvania, where my husband is from, there was a young fellow who was taken to the army against his wishes. That army at that time held people for 11 years or so, so it was not a joy to go to the army. So the boy wanted to escape from that small town of Transylvania. It was not because he was Jewish, it was because that was the thing. And the mother of my husband, who was a poor woman, didn't have much money, but she had a good heart. She went to all the relatives and collected money for a ship ticket, a dollar, a family. They put together the money, gave the young fellow the money. He bought a ship ticket to come to America in the 1920s. He became rich here. He had supermarkets. And by the time my husband, my son, and I arrived in 1951, we didn't know a soul, nobody in the United States, not one person. And then my husband remembered that boy who was helped by his mother and we wrote a letter from Baltimore that we were stationed. His name, Indianapolis. That's it. And in 1951, would you believe it, Indianapolis was such a small town that he, he was got in the letter. They found it. And yes, they found it. And then he replied and he invited us here and gave a job to my husband and ever since we live here. This is how we came to Indianapolis. Typical immigrant story. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Can you tell us how you got from the highway to Baltimore? Can I tell this gentleman how I got from the highway to Baltimore? I will be happy if you have the patience. From the highway, every morning it got harder and harder. And one morning, a woman had pain, painful feet and couldn't go any further. And the gendarme wanted to force her to march with the rest of them. And she couldn't. And she said, I just cannot get up. And then he was, she was shot. The man took out his gun and shot the woman at the front of everybody. I seen, that was the first murder that I have seen, age 16. And then I decided I'm not going to do that anymore. And I figured if I will be shot anyhow, then might as well I run for my life. The next morning, I removed the star from my outer clothing, it was still dark, and changed my appearance. I put my backpack into my trusty blanket, made a bundle out of it, put it over my arm, put a scarf over my head and pulled up the trousers above my knee that I shouldn't look like a camp inmate. And when it got lighter, there were groups of Hungarian people going toward the, the center of the country because they were bombed out, small town people, peasants. And it was a group of 50 who went this way. The women went that way. And I just stepped over to that group of people and continued to go with them to the opposite direction. And they were very friendly. They didn't say a word. They were good people. So I got back to Hungary, to Budapest, and I didn't find my family. I didn't know where they were. And I got shelter in a Swiss consulate building. In that building, 2,000 Jews were hiding, and I was hiding with them for about a month or almost two months, and until that building was destroyed also. And shortly after the building was destroyed, the Russian 
forces came in and liberated me. And this is how I got liberated. And a year later, I got married and with my husband emigrated to the United States. Short, very short story. <laughs> yes. Did you ever find your brother? Yes, I did find my brother. As a matter of fact, as I said earlier, we were four people, four different directions. We were all responsible for our lives. My brother asked for permission to enter an orphanage. The Hungarian children who lost their parents were collected by nuns and priests and various religious organizations. And it was a building where young children, young boys were kept. My brother, age 12, heard about it. And he lied. He pretended that he is a Christian boy and he lost his parents. Indeed, he lost his parents, but he wasn't Christian. And they let him in and he survived in that building, in that institution, until the war was over. But there was a rub. The boy, my brother, <coughs> is Jewish. And in Hungary, only the Jews are circumcised. Here in the United States, it is the preference whether you want your child to be circumcised or not, it's up to the parent. Over there, the Jews had to be circumcised and were circumcised. And my brother was a circumcised person and the rest of the orphan boys were not. So when he took a shower or when he changed clothes, he had to be very careful because as soon as he would have been found out, he would have been shot, not by the people in the orphanage, but he was, he was surely to be given up, and they would have done away with him. So that's how he survived, and when we got liberated, my mother and I went to that orphanage. We knew about it after a while, and we brought him home. Home, a broken down house, a bombed out house, yes. Any other question? Yes. Did you ever find um, your remaining contact with the, four, the three other girls that you stayed in that open meadow with? Did you ever find any other The question is whether I get in touch with the three girls with whom I slept on the open highway. The other two were no friends of mine. Only one was a friend, but she never came back. I don't know what happened to her. There are many, many people. We don't know what is their fate. They just disappear. She disappeared. I never met her again. And many times when I give speeches, I ask, I am asked, why didn't I bring her along with me when I ran away from the labor camp? And my answer is that I took my life in my hand. I risked my life. I didn't want the responsibility <coughs> to risk another life. I hope that she will have the courage to escape herself, but I didn't want the responsibility. So I don't know what happened to her. Yes? Who was your mother? What happened with my mother? Yes. Four people, four different directions. When I went to a labor camp, my father did the same way. Men and women alike were taken. My mother stayed home with my brother, the two of them. And then all the houses got emptied and taken into the ghetto that I described earlier. And the rumor was that nobody comes out alive from the ghetto. So they had to <coughs> assure that they will have some kind of a safety for them. She, my mother, put my brother into a school, an institution where children were in Jewish and not Jewish. But then later that became insecure, and as I said, he went to that orphanage. And my mother, one night, snuck out of the house where we lived, removed her star, just like I removed mine, and volunteered into a first aid station. Every <coughs> corner in Budapest, there were set up temporary first aid stations because the wounded and the sick were so numerous that the doctors, if there were any, were not able to handle it. So they took everybody <coughs> who volunteered to help the wounded and the sick. And my mother volunteered lying that she's a Christian. And at that time, the war was so advanced and so dangerous that they didn't care to ask questions. They accepted her on her words. 
she's not a nurse, she pretended she, <coughs> she's a nurse, and she worked diligently in that first aid station. She slept there, she got some food there, and she was there for some weeks until liberation. And this is how my mother survived. But in the meantime, she didn't know where my brother is, she didn't know where I was or my father. We didn't know about each other at all, that we are alive or not. Yes? What was the liberation process like? Once, once the Russians came in, then did, how did you get from there back to your home again? Uh, the liberation, how was the liberation process? Painful, thank you, very painful. <coughs> But for Jews, it was not as painful. Because for the Jews, it meant life. We were not the hunted anymore. People were not out to kill us just because we are Jews. We were like a population, like the rest of them, the part of Hungarians who were conquered. The Russian army comes in without food. They, I don't know how it is now, but at that time, they didn't have a kitchen. They came and they ate what they found. Budapest was surrounded already for months. It was hardly anything to eat. It was famine. People died from hunger in Budapest. Not only the Jews, the Gentiles as well. And the Russians came in and skirted the town, took, took it apart for food because they had to eat. They raped, they, you think that the raping in Kosovo is something new. It is not new. The Russians did it, I'm sorry to say. And they took the food and they took people for labor, regardless whether they were Jews or not. And like a conquering <coughs> country, very similar to what you see on television now in Serbia. But there was no difference between Jew and Gentile. It was a very hard, difficult situation. But we were not threatened for our religion. And uh, the second part of the question was how did uh, How from, did you get back home then once that process had started? Uh, I went back uh, after the liberation and I found my mother there. My father and my brother still was missing. Through the grapevine, we found out where my brother is in that orphanage and my mother and I went across the city through bound houses you walk from one end of the town to the other. Can you imagine all these rubbles like you see on television? We climbed on the bricks and, and, and the dust. This is how we went to the building that fortunately still stood and came to get my brother. So he was there, we took him home. The home meant we had a two bedroom apartment and at that time we had only one room, the rest was all broken down and the rain fell in and it was no roof on the rest of them. But that was our home. And my brother was there. Two weeks later, my father came home from the, corner, from the border of Austria. He was on the same death march as I was, but he went further. He didn't have the chance to escape. And as soon as the Russians liberated the forces, he turned around and walked home. It took him two weeks to come home. He was skinny and dirty and very, very tired, but he was home. And that four people, our family, survived in that fashion. But I must tell you that this is an exception. Most families lost members, younger, older, uh, mothers, fathers. Most families wound up broken because of the war after it was all over. I was very fortunate, and I feel fortunate also that I could be here and talking to you as well. Uh, one more question. Yes, young lady. How did you meet your husband, and was he in a camp as well? Uh, it is also a story in itself. <laughs> How did I meet my husband? And was he a camp survivor as well? Yes, he was a camp survivor. How did I meet my husband? After the Russians came in, as I described, it was chaos in Budapest. There was no food, no window pane, it was uh, no water, no electricity. It was a bombed out, poor, cold city. It was January. In February, people who could 
ran away from that city wherever they could go. I left the city with the idea of going to an acquaintance in the province who is not Jewish, because we know that there are no Jewish people anymore. And on the top of wagons, if any of you have seen Dr. Zhivago, this is how I traveled. And the train did not go there where I intended to go. The train took the people into a small town in Transylvania called Neutbanya. Neutbanya is a small, was a small town then, with 20,000 Jews at the time, who was all taken away. However, it was a handful of Jewish men who were hiding in the <coughs> mountains, didn't go with the rest of them. They came back after liberation and started a unit. They cooked and ate together. They helped each other out and they consoled each other because they lost their families. And I was the very first woman who showed up in that small town. <laughs> a Jewish woman, can you imagine how, how, well, how well they treated me? <laughs> they gave me the best bits of food. They, they collected clothes. They brought me flowers. They gave me music. They didn't know. They, first of all, it was the first Jewish woman they have seen since June. Uh, May 1944 took away the families and that was the following year, February. It was not a Jewish woman visible for the Jewish man for more than a half a year. And I showed up. <laughs> so anyway, and the first night I arrived there on the top of the train and they took me to a family. Family? Only one family was in the whole town who came through the border walking. They were, would have been taken away from Nagybanya if they would have been there. But they just came, and that man who came down from the mountain, one of the handful of Jewish men, was their nephew. And they lived in that one house. And I was directed to that house because I am a woman. I should live with a family, not alone or not where men are. Age 16, I want to know. <laughs> and they took me in, and the man that is another, I have to tell you, then I can. <laughs> I, I open, I knock at the door, and he, my husband, who is now my husband, opens the door, and I reach out my hand, and I say, my name is Gisela. And he holds my hand for a long, long time, and tears start to come down on his eye, and says nothing, just, just like that, at the door. And I didn't know then what happened. What happened was, that he had a bride, and, and he was engaged to a girl, Gisela, oh. and, and that girl didn't come back, but then she perished, and there I come, the first woman, Gisela. So this is how I met my husband. <laughs> Each of the survivors that come to us in this kind of marvelous setting, uh, their stories are different. And we're grateful, Gisela, for your sharing your life, your experience, and your message with us. We're most grateful. Thank you.